Hey everybody, how's it going? So welcome to Wheel Up My Ride, the extra bits. I think that's probably what I'm going to end up calling it. Um, I wanted to do a top tips video, a bit of a tutorial video based on the questions that you've been having since I've started to do Wheel Up My Ride. And you'll notice that I'm not in a Wheel Up My Ride episode right now. I'm actually in Arbor Valley uh, because there were also a couple of questions that came out of that episode that I did for Paulsley. So I wanted to um, sort of bring it all together and just answer the most frequently asked questions from all of those episodes in one video so that you can see how things are put together and you can see my thought process and my building style and, and my experience as well of, of running it so for those of you that don't know me you've never met me before um i work for a theme park company we've got worldwide attractions around the world so i don't i don't actually physically do the designing i'm not an imagineer or a designer or an engineer in any capacity but i work very closely with the people that do so for example i see all of their training material and i publish all of their training material and because i'm nosy i read it all um i see all of the planning documents i don't see them in advance so don't ask me for any secrets i don't know anything like that um but i i see the planning documents and i can digest the planning documents and then i get to see site layouts and when we go and visit a site we we get to go on tours so we can book to go and see certain things and because the company i work for is so open and so well connected with each other they will talk to you about anything so i've got to be really careful with what i do and don't tell you in the public domain like obviously i can't give you detailed information about things because they're all company sensitive but what it does do is it affords me the ability to go off and speak to other companies and go off and speak to other people that I can that I can get information from and then translate that into a generic package and this is where Real Up My Ride has come from. I use all of the generic information that I've got from multiple sources inside and outside of the company, make it generic and, and anonymous and bring it all together and play Planet Coaster and I've been playing Planet Coaster since the day it released as Alpha um, and I've clocked up well over 4,000 hours for my sins and I, I don't know if I'm ashamed of that figure or not because I play it a lot. Um, and Roller Coaster Tycoon 3 was exactly the same and everything. So all, what I've done there is, is I've merged the two together and I wanted to do the Reel Up My Ride series because I was also looking for the realistic elements of the park. So I, was, I would be looking at YouTubers and seeing these beautiful parks that are so artistically spectacular and wondering how they did it. And it's great because you you can see how they put it together from an artistic perspective but because i'm nosy and because i'm inquisitive i wanted to know the reasons why things were in the areas that they were why they were being done in the way that they were i could see that they look like that but i didn't know why and so when i got my job that's what i started to do i was like actually can you tell me more about maintenance areas can you tell me more about the end of year scheduling can you tell me more about rides training and can you tell me more about how the parks operate and i've seen the materials and everything that that a training and like I say I can't publish any of them and I won't publish any of them so please don't ask um, but what I can do is, is I can pull the two together and I like playing Planet Coaster and I think for all of its greatness it also has some of its flaws it doesn't deal with realism very well you you have the ability to plonk down coasters and have no other consideration but it also lends itself really really well to adding that realism if you want to add it you just need to know what to add and how to add it and that's the purpose of reel up my ride that's the purpose of doing that of this series is to take the stuff that you're sending me and to take the stuff that you're volunteering to me and adding the realism around it so staying loyal to your design but adding the realism elements around it have you thought about maintenance areas have you thought about guest flow have you thought about emergency evacuations have you thought about where your staff are going to be trained that sort of thing that's the purpose of the, the series anyway that's enough of that's enough about about me um, and, and my credentials, uh, if you call them that. Uh, I wanted to answer the first question really on Arbor Valley because a lot of people had and there were common questions actually that come across things like pathing and water tables and stuff like that. And we're going to come into that in this episode. But within Arbor Valley, there were a couple of questions and mainly around how I did these. Um, like curb stones and how I did the fencing and how I did the stairway and, and the, the landscaping here. So this is going to be the first thing that, that I'm going to tackle because we've got different sight lines, different terrain levels. So you can see here that Arbor Valley is built in the scenario that I released very back in the early days. I think it was probably about the release of 1.3 uh, called Vista Valley. No, it's not Vista Valley, it's Vista View. Uh, I don't even know the name of my own scenario. Uh, Vista View. Um, and it's on the side of a hill, essentially, is, is this is this scenario. So you can see that this is the 
put together. It was edited really nicely by Paul Slee for his series that, that he's doing, so I'm playing this version of his editing. Um, but the layout remains the same. It's just this big circle path around a nature reserve, and it goes up a really steep hill, and everything's hidden behind it. The episode, by the way, on me building this is, is available if you if you want to go and check that out. I'll link it in the description and stuff. And, uh, yeah, so I, I've been dealing with this this idea of terrain differences, and I wanted to build something on the side of the hill, and I don't like building on flat land if I can help it. So what I did was I continued the path around this lower level, and I raised the terrain slightly um, to have this effect. And I'm going to show you how to do this in, in a later part of the episode when, when we look at uh, Sunshine Park, I think it is, that we go into. Um, but I wanted to show you the, the landscaping that, that I use. So here you can see there's a flower bed, and it looks like it's auto save. Um, it looks like it's got it's coming out and it's on a level. And this is just a trick of the a trick of the light. There's nothing really special here. If I move these paths out, uh, these flowers out of the way, you can see that the train drops down to the level of the path. And actually, these flowers are a little bit floating. So I I sort of had to do a bit of trickery here to make this work properly. Um, but it creates this nice little level effect. I could also use the um, the actual dirt that we've got in the nature area. So these planters, I could lay them down and make it sort of like official as a, as a plant area. And sometimes I do that if I know that the, some of the dirt is going to be exposed. Uh, but I didn't want to do that here. I wanted it to be a full a full on flower bed uh, for this sort of aspect. And then the other thing that, um, that I've got is the stairs. So I tend to do the stairs by laying down some kind of long flat piece. So in this instance, it's this concrete pillar that I've just laid down. Um, so I just take the in the building, just go to the pillars, find your concrete pillar, like this, and then you use the advanced move and you snap it and then just roll it down and then you just stack them one on top of the other and you just create these fake stairs these full stairs and then you just recolor them and then and then away you go and then the other thing that I that I like doing is is lining off all of my paths so I, I like to take away the in-game curves and I like to add my own because you can you can do freedom things like this you can line your paths with fences you can line them with rocks and then you can line them with your own curved stones so in this instance I use the um, I just use the, the window seals that you find in the city set from Ghostbusters pack and colour them as you, as you will. I mean, I've left this to do full colour, but in other parks I've done it, I tend to use the grey to make it look a bit more concretey. Um, and it just lines them off quite nicely, but it also means that if you did want a formal flower bed where it's, it's flat to a level, then you, you, can also, you can also do that. But they're thin enough to be durable and you can sort of like, they're versatile enough to put along your path edges and, and have quite effective. And then you just vary your vegetation along here. So I use this in Colwell Wonderland, actually. I, I've definitely stolen this. You've got all of these hedges that are along the way that create a sight line, and then you just fill it out in the middle with different flowers and different textures of, of flowers. Mike Sheets will tell you that this is all very much very much wrong, and if he's ever going to watch one of these videos, I'd love to know what he would do differently, because I don't know the first thing about gardening. I just put things down because they look good, but the experts would be the likes of Mike that would see it and go, you've done that completely wrong, this is how you should do it. <laughs> so um, so anyway, that, that sort of like covers the first the first bit. I wanted to do uh, an, Ar an Arbor Valley one as well, um, but should, let's actually move on and let's let's move on to one of the other episodes and see what it uh, see what comes up. Here we go. I think the most frequently asked question I get from the first five episodes is how I end up with the paths and the plazas being so wide and, and sitting how they do. And so I thought I'd jump back into Sunshine Park from episode one to show you how I do how I do this, because the principle is exactly the same across all of the five episodes. So if you try and change the texture of the path, you can see that you, you sort of highlight areas where this texture would change. And this kind of gives away the secret a little bit here, in the sense that they are just pads of plazas that I've pulled together and created in different angles and different shapes and different variations. And then you just join them with normal paths, and then you end up having this massive wide path area. And then you're going to end up with some gaps, as you can see by the, the red lines that you've got on the screen now. You're going to have some gaps that you're going to need to end up filling. And so you then just need to find a creative way to fill those gaps. So you can see in this instance, this is quite a big, 
quite a, a big pad that it's trying to change there you go so that's the pad that it's trying to change and then underneath that you've just got the the red markings where the gaps in the path are uh, and this applies everywhere absolutely everywhere so you can see here that there's that there's massive gaps and you can see here that there's gaps so let me show you how i actually do this so i'll come over here to the blank area that I've got um, and what I'll do is I, I normally highlight where I want my, my plaza to be so I have probably laid down buildings already like I'd already laid down outlines of these buildings and where I wanted the main key things the rest like these two in the middle they follow later when you know what gaps you need to fill so I know that I wanted or I knew that I wanted the diner to sit here I knew that I wanted something to be along here and I knew that I wanted the ride photo booth to be at the top here so that kind of outlines the area that you're going to do your task is then to fill it with path right so in a real theme park most things most plaza areas or most pathing is is all very wide it's all just one mass of concrete whereas in planet coaster we, we're dealing with a pathing system where we have to manipulate the game to do it for us so essentially what we're doing is we're colouring in this area with path. So I would have laid out everywhere that I want buildings. And I wouldn't have built the buildings at this point. I just put some kind of a brick outline as you've seen in the in the updates. I then lay down my first piece of path. And so I, I then need to choose whether I want to have... Um, a wide plaza or a narrow plaza and so I tend to use four meter paths because it gives me much more control but in the most recent episode episode five I actually use the 10 meter plaza method just to spread it out um, but yeah so you, you just choose that based on your um, based on your preference for your plaza and I then lay down a couple of um, a couple of pieces and I come down to deselect grid and I make sure that I've got flattened terrain on because then if you are going to use anything to hide surfaces or hide the gaps then you're going to need to be able to sink something into the ground and if you've got an uneven surface then you end up having to bring that that up so anyway you draw out your your plaza area so let's say we're just going to do this little plaza area and then let's say i've got another building that's sitting along here actually you know let, let's do that let's real quickly do that um so let's go into uh, just like this that's just for argument's sake that we then want to have buildings like this and let's also say that we want one down here so let's just say this is our area that, that we're dealing with um, i'm just going to move this actually over here uh, so i will then lay down a second um a second plaza area and i might sometimes i might use the align to grid method here so I might do this because then it means that I can get the path flush to the uh, flush to the building. But be careful if you're going to use this method, because if you're going to have shops in this building, you might not have enough gap here for the game to generate the path it needs for the shop. So you might consider actually just just doing it freehand instead. And then let's say we're going to have another building here. So I'll do the same method again. Um, but this time, I'm not going to align it to grid. I'll show you the, the method of not aligning it. And the key to this is that you don't um, you, you're not you don't tie yourself to where your buildings are going to be. You you remain fluid. So like if this building is too far up, then you you have the fl flexibility to move it down. And because you've not built anything and, and you haven't committed to anything, you're good you're good to go in that instance. Um, so I just remove the flatten of the train and just add. This bit here so now we've got three plaza areas that we can play with now what sometimes what i'll then do is if i know that i want this to be the leading path i'll continue the plaza area out this way so that i've now got a leading path that way and then i'll also do the same up here as well so if i say that this is my leading path off this way like so and then starting to, to create almost like blocks of plaza areas where I know that I want things to be. And what I then do is I take the um, the normal path and I now just join it up wherever the game will allow me to do it. So let's say, for example, I go there. So I want it to join up there. Um, I know I definitely want this one up here to join. I definitely want something along here to join. Now, this is where we have to do a bit of jiggery pokery. We have to be clever with, with the game because you can see that you're not going to get the exact result that you want. So you sort of have to 
be flexible enough to work with the game. And if you, if like in this instance here, you can see it's just not going to let you do any of it. Then try using a different size pathway instead, because that might let you do it. And then we just go uh, this way, and then let's say we're going to go this way. So you can see now that the that the pathing system is, is not really enjoying this this idea of a of a plaza area here. And so let's go a smaller, and it will, or it might let you do. There you go. So you sort of have to, and you could you press Z by the way to to get this this effect where it's not snapping to anything. So if I'm if I'm pressing and holding Z, I've got full control over the angle that this that this path is going on, and I can then just move the mouse and. and uh, swing it through so it's either going to then snap to this top part of that second plaza or if I continue scrolling down or moving down it will eventually snap to the bottom part of that plaza and if, if the plaza was wider then it creates more snap points to, to work with um, so this is just a really rough demonstration and then you can see that then I've just got this space that I might want to fill so I then can use the pathing system again just to just to color it in and what you're doing then is you're just going along and coloring in your area so this looks quite unsightly at the moment this looks quite like rubbish but what you're what you're then going to do is decide about your other realistic uh, elements of it so are you going to have monetization options are you going to have some kind of decoration are you going to have anything that's going to be sitting in the way stat or standing in the way so I then move my buildings around the new plaza area like that and then I decide actually I might want to put a game stall here or I might want to, might want to put a flower bed here or I might want to put something here but when it comes time to uh, actually covering off that plaza area I'll then tend to use the firehouse roof from the Ghostbusters set um, and then I sink that into the ground like this and then I just create a uh, create an area and then I highlight it, duplicate it. And then assuming that this plaza is completely flat, you then start to colour in that area. And so what you end up having at the end of it is this ability to have this. And I'm just going to raise this up so it's exaggerated because I know that I didn't flatten this off to the same level. Um, and so you, what you then got is you've just got this coloured in area. And so all you then do is you just make sure that the firehouse roof meets your buildings. And so you're then covering off and hiding all of those unsightly uh, unsightly bits that you've got that you don't want people to see that there's a gap. And so you're almost pretending that this is a fully concreted pad of, uh, pad of plaza, when in reality, underneath it, it's not. It's just really roughly scrawn together um, and you've made your design decisions around it. And what I do with this firehouse roof is I actually make it a... Um, I outline it like a cartoon so cartoons have got this black edge right so this is what I do with the uh, with the firehouse pieces so I have this outline which is one of the uh, what they call the framework from the coaster support set uh, it's this one it's this one here the two meter post and I'll have it on the ground and I'll use the advanced move tool snapped to 15 degrees to make it sit into the ground like this we go and then I'll turn the angle snap off and I'll draw out a, a bit of a, a whimsical pattern so I'll just create some kind of there we go I'm do just like that and I'll then end up using the uh, uh, the firehouse roof that's sitting in here let's go back to the house then I use the two meter one to actually square it off like this, so I just place one down, select it, uh, duplicate it with the uh, Control X, and then I just use that to colour it in, and then that creates your outlined pad. Like this, like this. There we go. And so what you end up with is is that sort of outlined curved plaza area that's been um, uh, that's been quite nicely like topped off. And that's one way that then you can that you can hide those unsightly things. So if I move this completely out of the way, and I move this completely out of the way, you can see it's actually hiding pathing that doesn't actually work properly. Uh, but it's got a lot of things that have gone into it to actually hide it. So you've got your your firehouse 
uh, roof or your concrete padding, whichever you choose, to hide one part. You've got the wood to hide the, the next part to break it up slightly. You've got your building which sits on top of it, but underneath it, look, it's just this massive pad of green. There's no real effort involved to try and make the plaza do its thing, and that's because you've got the plaza here working with a normal path along here, a normal path down here, and as I, as I showed you in the very beginning, this one section here is now considered to be one massive path. So if I delete it, it would delete the whole thing. So, yeah. The other thing that then I do uh, sometimes is this element of... Uh, come on, I went over there too soon. Um, this element of raising the path and how I achieve this. So this is just done, again, using the terrain and the auto the auto terrain so I've seen some people that use flat rides on a certain angle and then they uh, flatten out the train to match that angle of that flat ride and then they delete the flat ride brilliant way of doing it it's really really good um, and the way that I tend to do it if I can't be bothered to make that kind of effort is I'll take the terrain and I'll raise it to wherever I want it to be so I know it might only be a meter or two I'll then take the path and I will make it slightly smaller, select flatten terrain, hold down control so that I've then, I'm not then auto, auto joining it to the path. And then I come in this way and I create a, a plaza uh, like this. I think it's gonna, because it's a bit too close. There we go. I'm just going to extend this plaza out as well so we're not going to mess around with the Path. And then what you'll do is uh, you've created now this this join that can be made. So I'll then select a different uh, size of path here. Press Z, which then uh, tries to connect it with the uh, with the path below. And you can see the different uh, levels will do different things. And because I've still got the flattened terrain on, this is now going to this now should create quite a nice hill, and it smooths out the hill for you. It's built in beautifully for the actual. Um, game itself and then all you do is you just cover it with whatever you choose so in this instance I've chosen to do this stairway so if I just copy this over um, and then I just sink it in and there you go you've got your, you've got your effectively your fake your fake stairs so you'd need to reprofile your stairs in this instance to make sure that it's flush with the path this just gives you an indication of, of how it would how it would work um, but that's how I achieve the the higher level bits I'll do the uh, the landscaping bit first then I place the path on the top level and then I join the the two paths onto the plaza and then you end up with that raised bit so that's everything for this tip let's move on to the next tip so rather surprisingly, out of episode 2, the most frequently asked question wasn't actually about the rapids, it was more of the backstage areas and how I decided where to put those backstage areas. So I've decided to jump back into the park, Aventura and Park, Helen Burbs. Yes! Only took 12 takes to say that right. Um, just to show you how I decided where all of these points needed to be in terms of backstage areas and everything. So here, here we are. Here's our here's our rapids ride. So uh, the layout was already done when we got the park. So I didn't touch the layout. All I did was just touched up the landscaping, took out the the hills, and put buildings in instead. But then I just had to decide where there were going to be maintenance areas. And I said that I was going to do maintenance areas for the rapids and, and a maintenance area for the actual roller coaster itself. So we're going to tackle this in two parts. The first one is the roller coaster. So the most frequently question I get about roller coasters in general is how do I decide where the maintenance shed goes? And that's a really good question because the answer to that has, well it has many answers. It depends on the actual roller coaster itself. So the general rule of thumb that you're looking for with maintenance sheds in real life is about the access to that shed. So are you going to have any point where external access by road and to the outside world is going to cross or meet the roller coaster track? That's your first question. Identifying where you can cross over from the outside world to the roller coaster track because you're going to need lorries, you're going to need vans, you're going to need access, you're going to need some kind of vehicular access, aren't you? 
the next question you then need to ask is how much maintenance is going to be done at the ride and we talk about this in uh, episode four when i'm doing the b m flawless i talk about how it all comes together how rides are maintained and whether it's done on site or whether it's done in a warehouse that's off the park and you transfer the bits as they get de deconstructed and everything so if you want to check that out that's in episode four but that's your next question is how are the rides going to be maintained and where are they going to be maintained and once you've got the answer to those two questions you can then decide where it's going to be so you normally tend to find them at the lowest points of the ride so it depends on who you work for and the terminology that the business use we use the term active area or active ride or live ride depends who you get who you're talking to in the business so your live ride in this instance is where the the actual ride is in operation where it's in motion where it's where it's actually physically working and so from here you can see that the ride the live ride is from the bottom of the lift hill to this break run here this is where the most action of the ride happens so you wouldn't want to put any kind of maintenance feature anywhere between the bottom of the lift hill and the start of this brake run because there's just no opportunity to do it like there's nothing at all so what you will tend to find is that maintenance sheds will be either linked somehow to the bottom of the lift hill or they will be linked somehow to a brake run or they'll be done in the station so this is the prime area that you're looking at for your for your maintenance areas here and then you decide how you're going to get the external access in and how that's how that's going to work so in this instance i've decided for this roller coaster that the maintenance is going to be done beside the station i'm able to hide off the maintenance area from guests by using walls and queues and an obscured sight lines and I, I we didn't we didn't decorate this part of the of the park in this episode because it wasn't the focus but if you look at uh, roller coasters like the swarm at thought park that uses obscured sight lines so well because you don't realize that the other side of that church queue that you've got is the maintenance shed you don't notice it as a guest because the wall's very high and you, you you can't see over the hall over the wall and you can't even sort of ollie up and look over either it's it's there as a, as a wall and raptor does it really well at gardenland as well so in this instance i've decided that you only need a small maintenance shed because the, the actual trains themselves are relatively small too so inside this maintenance shed you would have probably rows of track where you have let's say four trains you have four rows and then you just have a transfer track that then takes uh, the train from the actual main live ride area into the maintenance shed and what would then happen is these trains would then be dismantled there we go there's a train uh, these trains would be dismantled within this within this shed and they then get carried by either lorry or truck or van or whatever over to a central maintenance area in pieces and then all of those pieces then get laid out on the floor and they get inspected they get replaced they get done whatever needs to be done and then when they're ready to reconstruct it all of those pieces then get put back onto a van taken back to the maintenance shed and then they get re repurposed and built back together within this maintenance shed so as a result of not a lot of work happening in this maintenance shed you don't need it to be very big but if you were to do all of the servicing of the trains and the ride and everything within this shed you would probably look at maybe putting the shed here instead because you've got way more room so you'd have the the maintenance shed sticking along this wall and coming out this way instead and then having the vehicular access coming around the side with a bit of a, a, a um, maintenance bay area that's sitting here and that way then you've got way more room to do what you need to do here but it's exclusive to this to this roller coaster the other place that you could look at doing it if you were struggling for space would be this top uh, this top run here so you could if you had the facilities and if this terrain was different and everything you could then put it up at the top here so that your transfer track would be at this break run so your so your maintenance sheds don't have to be attached to a station they don't have to be attached to anything specific you could even have them at the bottom of the lift hill so if you watch povs of some of the wooden coasters and i think it's el toro that does it um the maintenance shed is nowhere near the station it's at the bottom of the lift hill um and so what you would then have is either the ability and i don't know this from from experience i don't know how el, el toro works i've never experienced it in real life um but you'd either have a two-way system um like a uh, tire system that would allow you to have trains going backwards and forwards so you would load it into the um into the maintenance shed that might be here 
and then it loads back out into the station and then onto the brake run. Or you load it onto the brake run and complete what they call a download, where there's nobody on the train. So you then um, bring it out onto the bottom of the brake run, you run it up the lift hill, around the track, and then into the into the station or into the maintenance bay area. So it's, it's completely sort of down, down to you to decide how that works. But in real life, you can sort of have that have that decision. You would you typically find, so to summarise that, you typically find your um, maintenance areas that aren't in the live ride area. So anywhere between the bottom of the lift hill and the beginning of the first of, of the first of the final brake runs would be typically where you would find the maintenance area and you decide how big that maintenance area is going to be by what maintenance happens at ride side. So would it be just general maintenance where they just do a few repairs and storage or is it a full-on maintenance area where you're going to be doing everything and that then dictates the size and the positioning that you're going to have. Now rapids work slightly different though. Uh, so rapids, you need a couple of a couple of maintenance areas because you've got a lot of facilities going on here. You are pumping a lot of water around a, a trough. Um, you are going to be doing a lot of maintenance on the trough. You're going to be doing a lot of maintenance on those pumps. You're going to be doing a lot of maintenance on the areas and the effects that you're running alongside as well. So in this instance, I've decided to do to do two areas, both of which incidentally are the lowest points of the ride. Uh, there's no real rhyme or reason to it. It's only to get it out of the, out of the guest's sight whilst we're dealing with the auto safe. So um, in this instance, the main backstage area is this is this one here where we've put it at the bottom of the lift hill. And that's because we decided this is where the water treatment plants are going to be. So in order for your guest safety to, to be paramount, you're going to want clean water. You're going to want some kind of... Uh, some kind of sterilised water. I'm not saying sterilised as in you could drink it, but you certainly don't want to be poisoning your guests with the water that you're running through your water pipe because you're splashing them with it, right? So you need to be careful about the water itself. That needs to be treated in some capacity. You need to have the ability to control that. So I've put this down at the bottom here because this is the absolute lowest point of the ride. All of the water is being pumped to the highest point of the ride around the troughs. Some of it will escape, but around the troughs, and it will keep going around the course of the ride until it hits the bottom. And then it comes back through the water treatment plant, back through the lift hill to the highest point, And it's pumped around again. So that dictates then how big your uh, water treatment is going to be and what facilities you're going to need. So they're quite power hungry facilities. You're going to need some kind of um, electricity power points. You're going to need the actual water treatment plants themselves. You're going to need some kind of administration office area where service bits are going to be done. And then you're going to need workspace area as well. And exactly the same as the roller coaster, you need to have some kind of vehicular access to it. And so that's that's the, the, this bit here. But because they're quite unsightly, and again, different rapids have got different serviceable areas. This is probably way too big for what we need. Um, you could, you would possibly get away with it being sort of half the half the size. But we put this here for exaggeration, didn't we? So, um, but because it's quite unsightly, you need a way of hiding it. And so in the second episode, we were talking very much about sight lines and how we hide it from guests. And that's how we do it. So um, we just did a massive wall that separates between the two. Same principle as the roller coaster with the maintenance shed. And I was talking about Swarm. So you just have this, uh, this wall that just hides it from uh, your guests. Now, over here by the, the other building, we've got a second access area. And this is because you're going to have some kind of fire exits or escape system for this area of the building you've got some kind of effects that are going on here you might have lights you might have fire you might have smoke lasers all sorts going on so if there's an emergency situation you need to get your guests out of this ride pretty damn pronto so um what we're doing here is we're we're exiting them either from the lowest point of the ride along here or or from within the building along escape channels that we've put in and then they would come out of this service building. But because you've got so many effects that can go wrong in here, you're going to have pipes that service uh, water. You might have uh, gas lines. You might have electricity cables for your lights. You might have smoke machines. And they have power and liquid that needs refueling and all sorts. So you have a, a smaller maintenance area just off, the, just off the back of the building here. You've got your HVAC units along the top here just to make sure that everything's ventilated well, especially if you're using things like gas you want some kind of ventilation and so here you've just got this this maintenance area that sits at the back um now in an ideal world you'd probably want to join the two maintenance areas so you'd have a road that runs around the back here 
um, just because you can then transfer from one to another quite easily. As it is at the moment, you'd need to tra take everything that's down here and move it all the way around the, the road wherever this would end up and come back round this way. So you're probably going to end up wanting to put a road along here just to connect the two and then you can transfer materials between the two. Um, and then the, the other reason that they're down at the bottom here is to keep them out of the guest view here. So as you can see that we're... Um, we're in our actual main plaza area. You can't see the uh, you can't see the maintenance areas at all, and so you're hiding what's very unsightly and very ne uh, necessary facilities, but you can't actually see them very well. But you can see them sort of poking through the top because I'm not at actual peak level, but we've hidden them and obscured them, and you definitely can't see them from behind the building. Uh, over there, so you sort of place them out of the guest view. The only thing you then need to consider is that your monorail can see it. Um, along here and your roller coaster can see it but your roller coaster you're going to be traveling too fast to really care and then your monorail you quite often see backstage areas of the park as you're going along um so that's the, that's the main question i got from the second episode is, is all about the maintenance areas and how i chose where they were going um so let's move on to the next one shall we so taking a look to episode three then, that generated a couple of frequently asked questions, more to do with the guest flow and more to do with some of the building techniques that I was using. So let's tackle that in this one. We also got the, the plaza question as well, but we've, we've answered that from, from episode one. The technique is exactly the same as you saw with the updates. I placed the buildings and then I just coloured in the, the bit in the middle with, with path and then did the decoration. So principle remains exactly the same. But the, the biggest question that we got when we were talking about guest flow is how we manage it and how we keep the guests safe. So this is all to do with signage and it's all to do with planning your areas appropriately. So as we already spoke about in the episode, you need to have the ability to separate guests as quickly as possible, keep them as far away from each other as possible whilst also managing managing those crowds. And so remembering that you've got two types of uh, guests, you're going to have your regulars, they know where they want to go. You're going to have your non-frequent regulars who may not know what they want to do. They may not want to, they may not know what, where they want to go. And so, and so they're going to get in the way. Um, and so what you do is, is you plan for that, for that accordingly. You have to always be assessing your crowds and then assessing whether the setup that you've got is appropriate for that, for that crowd. Uh, and so that's what we've done here. In this instance, we were separating where our facilities were. So if somebody needed the toilet, they've got three places that they could go. Uh, we separated food from rides. Uh, we separated the um, the main flow through the left and the right hand side. Uh, and then we also had these rides at the top that we separated with a, with a plaza. So what we were doing here was creating as many opportunities as we possibly could to, to split out those guests and to split everything out. But the one thing we didn't really touch on, and we said it quite a lot about emergencies, and we didn't really touch on how we actually deal with those emergencies and how we keep the guests safe. So we already know the principle of um, changing the guest behavior uh, based on signage and based on what we do with, with the area. And then you alter the area around it to suit your guest behavior. So, for example, this water pad here, is it deep water? Therefore, do you put fences around to keep them safe? Do you do the risk assessment, say, get rid of the water? Or do you work with the guest wanting to splash and wanting to do things that they shouldn't really be doing and make it a splash pad instead? So it's safer for them to do the wrong thing. Uh, and likewise, with fences and everything that you've got, where you've got guests that are going to be uh, going to be climbing fences and you've got kids that are going to want to run around and, and do all sorts of all sorts of things. So what we did here is because this is the most frequented area, this is going to be one of the busiest areas that your park is ever going to see because every single person that enters and leaves your park will leave through this area. This is only a one entrance park, so every single guest is coming past this area. So what, what you do here is you create as much of a buffer between danger and guest as you possibly can so in this instance we've got this two fence principle so we've got the first fence which is sort of up to guest waist guest shoulder height kids are going to be able to climb but they're not going to be in any kind of danger and adults are not going to be able to really jump the fence because if they did they're going to be met with all of these bushes so you're sort of making it difficult for them to enter into a into a restricted area but then behind that you've also then got an actual restricted area so it's it's fenced off it's signed off you've got what you've got the appropriate warning signs in place so you're altering the guest behavior here so you're allowing the guests to 
be able to jump up and, and climb on the fences and do what they want to do with the fences, but they're not going to be putting themselves in, in that much danger because they're not actually next to the restricted area, the restricted access area. And then if they do approach that, they've got clear warning signs that are spaced appropriately to say, no, this is a this is an area. So the warning signs themselves, they, they vary based on what ride it is that, or what danger it is that they're protecting you from. So you, typically you'll see signs that have consistent wordings. They have to be by different compliance laws around the world. They have to be a specific wording for it to be legally compliant. And I, I, I won't go into each of those specific wordings because it's different wherever you are in the world. But typically it would be some kind of ride area danger sign. Um, those signs would also then need to be specific colours and contain specific imagery. And the reason that that's done is so it creates a universal sign so that you, whenever you see the sign you can instantly recognise it as a danger sign. So take the principle of the stop sign on the roads. The stop sign around the world is always going to be a red sign on an octagonal uh, base. It doesn't matter what the word is within that stop sign wherever you are in the world it's always going to be a stop sign and so that's instantly recognizable throughout the world as a stop sign the same applies to things like fire exit signs you will tend to find that your fire exit signs will be green and white and they will contain the white silhouette of the door and the white silhouette of the person running out of the door so then it doesn't matter what language you speak or where you are in the world you know that's a fire exit because it's a universally recognized symbol for a fire exit and so that's the principle that you that you play with here in terms of your ride areas your yellow warning sign doesn't matter if you can't read the language that this is in um, this obviously is in English so it just says danger ride area do not enter and I've, I've taken this from the workshop so this isn't themed to this to this park uh, but it's the consistent wording. You would see this wherever. And you then space the signs appropriately throughout the restricted area so that it doesn't matter where you are standing, you have access and visibility to a sign. So if I were to only have one sign here, for example, if I was stood here, I can't clearly... Well, that's a bad example because I've got a tree in the way. <laughs> I can't clearly see that there's a danger ride area sign here. I can see the ride behind it. I'm not stupid, but people remember, remember the principle of stupid people will do stupid things to do stupid things. And so uh, if I've only got the one sign here, I can't physically see it here. I may also be visually impaired. I may not be able to see that sign from this distance. So I need to be reminded frequently that this is a boundary of a dangerous area. Likewise over here, you may have danger deep water or no swimming signs and you'd need to place them frequently along the along the actual perimeter of the danger just to make sure that the guest is uh, aware of it the other thing as well guests get distracted theme parks are really busy really exciting places and they may not notice your one sign that you've put in but if you spam your sign i say that quite loosely if you spam your sign around your danger area then you reduce the risk that that, that guest is going to miss that sign um, and so you sort of have to work with that with this area and then the wording of the sign depends on the danger that sits behind it so for example this one here you've got danger right area this one you might have danger deep water um, and then behind a roller coaster where it's traveling at speed and getting into the actual ride area itself and, and potentially being stricken struck stricken or struck by a train um, is potentially going to be fatal you then may change the wording and you may see the wording as danger of death so again each risk assessment that you do for each ride will determine the wording that you use for that sign uh, there is no rhyme or reason or rule that you follow and um, it's all to do with the risk assessment that's done for the ride and how it's then categorized and then where you are in the world so as long as as long as the realism aspect of planet coaster comes into play as long as you're using consistent signing uh, signage then you're going to obtain that realism and if that signage is something along the lines of danger ride area then that would be sufficient for your realism in planet coaster but if you're going for that ultra realism you would say all of my thrill rides have this specific sign all of my roller coasters have this specific sign and all of my access to water has this specific sign and so that's what you would that's what you would do there and in an emergency as well we were talking about how guests will leave oh, I don't know what's going on with this monorail this is doing this in the episode um, we were talking about how guests will leave the way they know not the way that's safe 
so you have to create safe spaces for them. And so we we're talking about the principles of queue lines. That's where your, your biggest danger is going to be. You've got a lot of people potentially standing in an area that need to leave very quickly or potentially need to leave very quickly. And so what you do is you create as, as many touch points along pathways as you possibly can. So in this instance, we've got, you'd probably have maybe um, some kind of chain link here instead of a, a physical fence. But you've got the ability to have these guests escape, escape very quickly from uh, the queue line by coming either down here or if it was if it was more safe to do so through the right area and out of the out of the exit and the same is true over here as well so I've created as many touch points to the pathway as I possibly can um, so that any guest that's in this line this line this line or this cattle pen can leave very easily if they needed to and that then would flow quite nicely down through the queue line itself. Same is true that you'd probably put some kind of artificial pathway or you would have some kind of ability to exit, escape for this little cattle pen that we've got in our um, pagoda as well. Whether that's into another plaza area or what, I don't know. That's just a design decision that would need to be made by the park. But you'd want to have an evacuation as much as possible and the length of the queue completely depends on the ride so when you're designing and building your rides you will automatically as part of that process you'll decide what the what the guest draw is what the expected guest draw is of that ride so when you submit all of your plan information in the UK you have to give a kind of an indication of how many guests you're expecting to attract as a result of that ride you'll then work out things like the rides throughput and um, so if it's a roller coaster you'd be probably looking at upwards of a thousand for a typical roller coaster your good roller coasters would be 1400 people per hour um, if you're a smaller park you might be dealing with maybe six eight hundred people per hour but as soon as you then compare your um, your flow your uh, people per hour with the number of guests you're aiming to attract and you do a comparison of an average queue and then you say right so on average we would expect the queue for this ride in the first three years to be two hours to be three hours and that's consistent with the other rides that we've launched up until this point that equates to this number of people and so you then design the queue length to be 50% more than your estimated capacity because you need to account for quiet days and you need to account for your peak days where you may have Halloween or fireworks or some kind of seasonal event that, that goes on where you're going to be attracting potentially up to your capacity so you need to sort of have a median and go on average we reckon the queue for the first three years is going to be about two hours and that equates to this number of people and therefore each person represents this amount of space and this is the amount of queue line that we then need to have but then you account for your busy days where you go above and beyond what you expect and your quieter days where you say actually we wouldn't have a queue at all it'd just be a walk-on and so when you're when you're designing that queue, you then decide whether you're going to have um, cutoff points or um, merge points, where you say actually if we're only only 10% capacity, let's shut off a lot of the queue line. And so what you would do in that instance is where you've got cattle pens, you would then have chains. So you'd say actually I want to close off this cattle pen, and I just want to have guests coming straight across here into this second cattle pen, and I want to close. Let me just get rid of these trees. Um, so I want to close all of this cattle pen because it's not needed um, so I can just bring guests down this way and that's another way that you can manage safety because if anything happens whilst this is empty then your guests are all already um, gathered down in this area here and they can escape quite easily but then your quieter rides like this one may not necessarily need such a queue so you may say actually this ride can deal with 600 people an hour we don't anticipate that at any point there's going to be more than 100 people queuing so therefore we're going to have a smaller queue and then that just dictates the size of the queue that you would then want from it your roller coasters will be typically longer um, and then you decide how that is going to interact with your ride so do you have the space to spread it around and create a feature of it or do you want to squeeze as much of the queue as you possibly can into one area uh, and cattle pen it and that's that's your design decision that you make as you go along so you can see that that's a design decision that's been made by these coasters already um, and then this one here is the same it sort of feeds around but it also cattle pens so you so you decide that when you're when you're actually designing it 
And then the other bit then is just the design techniques that I did here. So uh, just to pull this apart, I'm going to do this to do this really quickly because I go into quite a lot of detail in the video, but um, I just want to make sure that I cover it off because it is a frequently asked question. So if I pull this, oh, that's a light, uh, pull this one out. So all this is is just the shop front. The actual wall itself is from the um, adventure pack. Well, that's a that's a window. <laughs> Um, so the wall itself is from the adventure pack, it's just turned the other way around and just coloured. Um, then I've got a window that creates the actual window effect. I've then got the shop front that you find, that just sunk into the wall. Um, I've put a light on the top here from the haunted pack. Um, this that creates the pad that the light is sitting on is actually the bracket for, uh, it's the, bracket for the um, TV screens. And then you've got this which is your wooden beam that you find in your in your beam set this is just an art shape but there's four of them so there uh, so the, the front one is just one and then the back one is four so if we do that and pull it apart there you go so pull that apart um, these are just your brick columns so nothing nothing special there these are art shapes so I'm just going to pull that outside there. So these are just your typical art shape that you find. Uh, this is your same wood column that's along the along the roof, like that. Uh, this is to so the awning. That's your adventure piece, just on a on an angle. These are your fences that you find, like that. Um, and you've just got brick. The brickwork that you find in the normal and then your roof are the same adventure pieces just turned upside down onto each other and then copied across so that's that's how uh, that's how that building is is put together uh, it's actually quite a simple setup it just uses a lot of pieces to to do it and it's it's using almost the windows as walls technique it's just they're not windows they're um the uh, adventure pieces instead and then the principle of the season pass oh the text by the way is tmtk whoever did this i far overuse your your stuff and i love them really really love this text it's so good um and then over here set same principle just your but it's slightly but it's a different setup the walls are actual walls um just your normal uh, painted wood pattern then you've got your wood beam then you've just got some windows you've got your planters for from the um what they call the fairy tale set you've got some wall uh, you've got some uh, doors but this is slightly different in the sense that you've got the wall the door sunk into the wall like that so uh, I've put these on different grid so if I remove if I take the grid down there we go and then just sink the back in here so the door back in there so that's all I've done there um, and I've sunk it in and made it so that it's inset uh, nothing else really that these are the same design it's the um, art shapes wood panel windows I didn't do I didn't do the inset of the windows though they are just the windows on the uh, on the wood panel um, but using these beams just to hide the fact that they're sticking out so it creates a bit of of a bay window effect um, and then these are Idro's letters they light up in the in, in the night absolutely awesome love them and then your entrance area exactly the same principle I wanted to keep the same design so the pillars are exactly the same just recolored the roof is exactly the same as the ticket booth just slightly copied, copied slightly differently same principle with the uh, uh, with the actual um, pillar and then I didn't put any kind of turnstile in here because of the way that the park is set up. I could have edited the park and moved the park entrances and had turnstiles in here, but this was representative enough. So anyway, that's enough talking for this for this episode uh, or for this question. So that's uh, episode three and the frequently asked questions. So let's move on. So we're back in the Alpha Park then for episode four, which was the B&M that I had that I tore down, started again, and then reprofiled completely. And the most frequently asked question that I get about this coaster 
is how I did the inversions and also about the pacing of the ride as well. So I know that we spoke about it in the updates itself, but I thought I'd go into a little bit more detail with the, the pacing of the ride. So when you're designing a coaster, and remember, I'm not an engineer. Um, I can only go by the anecdotal stories that I get told by the engineers that, that have designed rides and by the design documents and specifications and everything that, that I've seen. And um, when you're designing a coaster, you want your guests to go through a certain experience. So a G-Force would feel the same in terms of on the body, but it, you experience it different, differently depending on the inversion and everything that you go through. And you've essentially got three types of G-Forces to account for. You've got your lateral G-Forces that force you side to side. You've got your negative G-Forces that are your weightlessness. This is your flow to air time, your ejector air time. And you've got your positive G-Forces that make you feel heavier than you actually are. This is your drag that you have. And you tend to find your... Uh, positive g-forces at the bottom of drops where things level out and go start going back up your negative g-forces will be the ones where you go over the top of a hill and your lateral g-forces are the ones where it forces you side to side and so you want to control how your guests are interacting with those g-forces because that's quite that's quite an important thing and so in this coaster i've done that with the pacing and i've looked at how the g-forces are going to be affecting and these are the these are the stats i mean in real life you, your lateral g-forces might be a bit too strong and um, so i just need to find out where my strongest lateral g-forces are and, and correct that but these are relatively okay for real life stats if, if that's what you are if that's what you were looking for and in terms of pacing what you want to do is make sure that the g-forces that you're experiencing throughout your inversions are consistent throughout so that uh, you're not putting too much stress on the on the body and then you also want to decide whether you're going to give your, your guests a break from the constant onslaught of g-forces by using things like bends and twists and turns and everything uh, so that it doesn't become repetitive so like inversion after inversion after inversion becomes repetitive some people love it like the, the smiler at alton towers some people love being thrown upside down 14 times and other people hate it because you get thrown upside down 14 times and that's down to your own personal preference and so designers of roller coasters need to take this into account when they're designing a ride. It has to be effective. But when you're dealing with when you're dealing with pacing, the way that you make sure that each of your um, elements feel consistent with each other is by reducing the size of them as the train starts to lose momentum as it goes around the track. So as as we all know, physics 101, um, you've got the potential and kinetic energy that comes from rising to the top of the lift hill and then you hit a certain terminal speed and then your train based on friction and based on elements and everything will then start to slow down as it goes around the track. So you need to account for that when you're dealing with your reversion. So you can see this prime example here, and I did this deliberately, that this Immelman that I've got here is smaller than the Immelman that I've got here. And that's because the train, by the time it hits this last part of the, the track, uh, is already going to be slowing down, but it still needs to feel very similar to the Immelman that was here. And so the same is true with these two corkscrews. This corkscrew is far bigger than this corkscrew is here, um, but the feeling and everything is the same. And in game, you can check this by using your heat maps. So you can check your lateral g-forces. Um, I just go previous data, and you can check what like, you can see that everything is pretty consistent with each other. You can check your vertical g-forces. So at the bottom of this hill, it's relatively similar to the bottom of this hill. It's relatively similar to the bottom of this hill. So you can see that, and at the bottom of the the moment here. So you're hitting around about the same forces every single time, and that creates a bit of comfort amongst discomfort for your riders so g-forces are going to be uncomfortable for your rider but that's why we do it right that's why we love the thrill of it but you also want to make it as comfortable as you possibly can for them when they're doing it it's just auto safe um so yeah you want to make the riders comfortable as you possibly can so pacing wise you need to make sure that your train when it's losing speed is hitting your aversions at about the same consistent speed and that involves either Reducing the size of your size of your inversions, or it would involve um, oh, that was a long auto save. It'll either in, uh, reduce the size of your inversions, or reduce the height of your inversions, so that you can see this one actually ends up. This is the lowest point of the ride, whereas before this would have been the lowest lowest point of the ride. So you sort of work with you work with what you get what you get given. And in terms of how I actually did the inversions themselves, relatively uh, simple. So. I use the four meter method and people, it sort of divides people. It's a bit of a Marmite, for those that know Marmite, it's a bit of a Marmite thing. You either love it or you hate it. Well, I like to use the four meter method because it gives me far more control over the track. Um, what it does do though, is it creates a bit of 
weirdness when it comes to trying to do things like Immelman's. So sometimes you might want to consider using a slightly different method. Um, but the principle remains exactly the same. So for the um, for the actual zero G roll here, it's got heart line on it. So um, I go up in steps, I snap it to an angle and go up in steps and then smooth it out. Um, and then for the Immelman, I do exactly the same. So you sort of go up in steps and then you hit the 90 degrees and then you go up in more steps. So let me show you how that's actually done. So if I just take coaster at, no, that's right, coaster at random. Uh, so let's go the actual werewolf because it's it's the same. So here's here's my actual train. I go to straight track. I'll bring it down to the four meter method. Sometimes I use five, sometimes I use six. It depends on the, the height and the speed. But typically let's use the four. I'll make sure that I've got my banking offset on. And uh, I saw this in a in a Silv video actually that I always have my banking set to far more than I need because when you smooth it out you're going to lose some of it. Um, and so if I'm doing a barrel roll, I will just literally go through the barrel roll. So 45, 90, 135, 180, and then you just you just reverse the process. So 135, 90. 45 zero like that and so again you, you can change the the um, steps that you're using if you want to make them greater or shorter depending on the the size of the inversion that you're that you're looking at doing but ultimately what you're looking for is this s if you've got the s you know that you've got a good a good inversion and then when you bring it down to sight line the idea is that your heart or your guest heart is supposed to remain in exactly the same place as the train is going around the track so the heart should always be in this dead center um, and then you can do it with heads you can do it with feet if, if you've got a different different roller coaster as well so zero g rolls very similar i'll bring the track up to either 35 or 45 depending on the actual speed and, and everything that i want and then i start from here to bring it down to 33 and then 45 on the on the roll 22, 90, 11, 135, flat, 180, 1, uh, 11, 25, 135, and then you just reverse the process like this. Uh, so 90, 45, and 45 and out, like that. And then flatten it off like that and like that and so again you've got exactly the same principle just the same as the barrel roll but this time you're zero Ging it instead so it's on a hill to start with you've still got that ribbon effect um, that I showed that I go on about so if you put the train there the train the, the track sort of comes up and around and down um, and then you just smooth that out and again you, you change the, the, the snapping and the length of the track depending on the coaster you're doing so if this is if this is a coaster that's traveling at a lot of speed you might consider doing this method but using five meters instead or six meters instead um or you might consider doing it snapped to 22 degrees or however you prefer to do it you know it's you need to adjust it for the for the actual coaster that you're doing but typically i find that this works really well regardless you just then change the height um of the zero g just to slow the train down remember it has to hit the inversion at a certain speed and the other are the, are the most difficult uh, the most difficult ones so but i tend to use the same method and I'm, I'm going to do this way more exaggerated than than it needs to just because it shows how i do it so i normally snap it to either 11.25 or 15 depending on the size but i'm going to do it to 11.25 on this one so i snap it up one and then one and i keep going until i hit vertical and like I say, this is going to be way more exaggerated than this one is. Uh, like this and like this. And then because your train is traveling at such a speed, it's going to have lose, lost, lost a lot of its velocity by the time it hits vertical. So from this point, it's going to be decelerating quicker than it was traveling to start with. Decelerating quicker at this point on than it was de decelerating from this point up. And so now I snap it to two instead. And then two more. And then two more. And then when you're starting to uh, level it out like this, this is where you start your roll. 
on the four meter method, or this is where should I say I start my role. Um, so I know already from the episode that we did that Immelmans they don't continue the roll from 180 to 360. They go back down to zero. So with this one, I need to be rolling out the same distance as I do. Um, uh, rolling out the same. Yeah, rolling out the same. So I'm going to be bringing it to here. And then. That's it. And then across to 11.25. I'm going to snap it down two again, and I'm going to keep it on this 11.25, but now I'm going to continue the roll down to 135. Then I'm going to level it out, bring it down in another two, so it's now X. Well, I'll, I'm going to leave this out at 35, actually, and then continue it down this way. And down this way. So again, this is well exaggerated um, as a... As a, as a shape you tend to find it's a better shape if you're using it smaller but that's that's the principle that i use so it creates like this weird elongated circle um because it needs to be this sort of parabolic at the top because it's it needs to travel through a shorter amount of track because it doesn't have as much speed but this now in, ensures that you've got consistent g-forces and if you're wanting to look at the reasons and the physics behind it there's videos out there from mathematicians that do a far better job of explaining the maths than I ever could, so I'm not even going to try. Um, but that's the sort of shape that you're going to be looking at. And like I say, this is really exaggerated. Um, this is achieving it far better in terms of in terms of shape. Um, but then all I do once I've done the done the inversions and once I've done the rest of the track is the just finish off the four meter, the four meter method. So you take the four pieces, you smooth it, you move it along, smooth it, you move it along, smooth it move it along smooth it and then the actual track designer will then do the the rest for you and then when you hit the end so I tend to go either to block breaks or to a, a pre-made inversion that I've used like a corkscrew or whatever and then go backwards so you get to the end there and you go backwards go backwards go backwards like that and you repeat this as many times as is needed actually to make it to make it smooth. I tend to find anywhere between three and six times is is sufficient. But then it starts to smooth out the, the track for you there, look. So you can see it's not so janky, it's not so not so horrid anymore. Um, and so that's that's how I do the inversions and that's how I did the uh, that's how I did the, the B and M. So let's move on to the next one, shall we? And now we're back in episode five, and this is the log flume project that we were working on. And the most frequently asked question that I get from this one is all around water tables and how we can deal with water, how log flumes can be sunk into the water because you can't really build them properly and so on. So let's tackle these ones, shall we? So if you haven't seen the episode yet, this is the log flume that we built. and We've got essentially three areas, three bodies of water on this one. So we've got the main splash lake where we're going to find our main uh, first, well, our main drop. We've then got a second lake that's sitting at the back, and this is one of those overgrown overspill lakes. It's just a, an area for water to collect because it's escaped somehow from the, from the log flume. And then we've got a more controlled water source that's in a concrete channel. So the water would lap over this area here, and it would come down to the bottom area and into the water treatment facility, which we were talking this about this um, functionality as part of the uh, rapids episode that we were doing. So. In terms of how I actually physically do this, though, and, and sink the, the log flume into the water, this was already done, by the way, when, when the uh, log flume was handed to me, but it is something that I've used in, in parks myself. So the way, that, the way that you do it is the first thing you do is you design, you design your log flume. So let's uh, can we copy it. No, we can't copy it, can we? Uh, so the first thing you do is you design your actual log flume itself. So let's take a log flume, just random blueprint that's on here and then what you do is, is you, you decide how you how you actually want it to sit in the water so you then adjust your terrain around the actual ride itself so let's just go with this randomly and then you adjust your water level to suit so straight away you can see that actually my my water it's all is only ever going to reach a level based on how the uh, how the game has calculated the actual terrain itself 
but the, the the log flume is never actually submerged. It always sits on top of the water as if it's, if, it's a, as if it's a plane of water. And sometimes you don't see that in real life parks. Sometimes you want to have the ability then to sink it into the water like we've done over here, like Adam's done over here. And as you can see, it's it's sort of submerged. So what you then do is once you've once you've sorted out your landscape and how you want everything, you then take your log flume and you can then sink it into the ground. And as long as your station area, which is, seems to be the most uh, important area of this, as long as your station area isn't interacting with the water, then you can sink your log flume down into the water. Be careful with how far you sink it down, though, because your boats will flood on the inside. Um, and you end up sort of like floating through the water and you're going to drown your guests. Uh, but that's, that's, the, that's the principle. So what I tend to do is I have it slightly higher like this so that the water level of the splash pool is the same as the water level that I've now created in landscape and I will then go ahead and I'll raise the terrain probably not that much um, I'll raise the terrain around the uh, around the flume itself around the station uh, to about there shall we say so I know that that's the level that I want my terrain to be I'm then going to come back in, I'm going to move my flume back out of the way, I'm going to finish off my terrain, and I then move it back. And so as you can see, um, I, would, I would do this, this takes a long time to do by the way, this is literally just for me to, just for me to show you. And you, then, you can then see that you've altered the, the terrain enough that you can now have this on flat land. Um, this is now the water is now flush to your lower level land, but your splash pool is now sitting inside, um, inside the actual pool itself. And so when Adams designed his, he's actually designed it that there's a second lift hill that that brings the the level of the actual ride itself back up to station level. And so that's another way that that you can deal with that. Um, you do see it on log flumes and you sometimes you don't like loggers leap for example never used to do that and nor did um the flume at alton towers but i have seen log flumes that rise back up into the station by using the same conveyor lift um yeah so that's that's how i would that's how i tend to do it is i always want to integrate the splash pool that is in game into the actual lake itself that i've designed and then i just decorate around the lake and just make it look more natural you can do that by your train painting you can do it by adding foliage and the best way of the best just really crudely um the best way of actually getting the realism though is to go and visit a lake go and see what foliage looks like around the lake how the reeds and everything interact with the water line and how uh, rocks and everything go on and actually you'll be surprised to find that sometimes you do just have stark grass that goes into water you don't necessarily have a shoreline as such it is just grass that goes into water so sometimes you can, you can get away with it um, and other times you might then also want to physically fence it off or physically wall it off and so you end up having this instance where I'm just going to choose some building pieces at random but you might choose your brick pieces or whatever um, like this so you create a physical wall and then you use a flat roof piece I just do this for contrast so you can so you can see it this doesn't look very nice in any way shape or form um, so there you go so you might you might do something like that and then you place your path along the side of Whoops, along the side of your actual pool. What have I got? Yeah, let's just turn this off. And then you sink this down into here. And then you've got the illusion that you've built some kind of plaza. And I mean there's a way there is a way that you that you can do it by using the technique in the first part of this or from episode one um but yeah so you can give the illusion that you've created some kind of a plaza that looks out onto the splash pool and so you you sort of force the realism it may not be functional in the in the actual game itself but you're forcing that that element of realism into the actual log flume itself um and so that's that's what i like to do i like to have a lot of path interaction a lot of guest interaction with the actual flume 
area, particularly the splashdown area. So you might even consider putting a bridge across across here so that your guests can actually get wet. And the good, the, the nice thing is with the the log flumes themselves is the splash actually projects forward. So when the train comes down, uh, the train, the, the boat comes down, the actual drop itself, it creates a splash that throws forward. So if you put a path across the uh, across the splash zone, it looks like the splash has gone over the path and then you can get your guests sweat. I think we've got one coming down here. So in in this instance, what I could have what I could have done is had some kind of plaza area that juts out here at just the right height, and then this splash that's just been created can then um, sort of wash over the top of the path, and gives that gives that shoot the shoot um, impression of a splashdown. So you've then got that guest interaction there. And the other question that I get quite a lot is about pools. Um, and fountain areas. So unlike Planet Zoo, Planet Zoo does it amazingly in the sense that you can use the the, the barriers, um, the enclosure barriers, the glass ones particularly, are they watertight? So you can just create a really thin barrier, sink that into the ground, move the terrain around it, and then put your water in. Planet Coaster, we have to do that ever so slightly differently because there's a, a width requirement um, for the landscape that's around a water source. And I think the width requirement is three, uh, three meters. So in order for it to register as being a, a genuine pool. So like if I remove a small bit here, uh, like this, it will just disappear. The, the, the water just disappears because it thinks now that it's not, it's not a genuine um, pool itself. It's not a, a genuine body of water. So you sort of, again, you have to play it a little bit clever. If you're doing a raised, a raised piece like this, what I tend to do is, is raise the terrain so that it creates an actual pool itself. And I would then consider the plaza um, effect that I've been using all along, where I then come along, put the path in, and then I would put the water back in again. Um, and then what you need to do is, is hide the actual edges of the... Um, of the terrain so you can see that the edges here are going to be sticking out so sometimes what you can do is use a real fine brush along here on a on a low intensity setting low size setting and you can sort of sculpt not like that though it's, it's really quite picky with what you can do but sometimes you can sculpt the terrain so that it's not um it's not poking out anymore but like I say, you have to take your time doing it. This isn't something that you can do in a, in a couple of minutes as, as a demonstration. Um, you have to really, really think about think about how you're going to do it. But then once you've once you've nailed it, once you've got that element in, you can then start to to decorate it around with your uh, with your walls, and you can then also decorate it using your uh, your path cover technique that we were using before. So although your path might come out to here, for example, you can make it look like your path goes to the edge by using the firehouse roof technique um, and you're almost tricking the eye into thinking that it's a bigger plaza than it, than it actually is and the other way that you can do it where it's sunk into the ground so rather than doing it where you're raising the pool off the ground um to auto save at the wrong moment uh, this, this happened quite a lot this episode doesn't it um what i what i can do here is create my square come on of plaza area that i want my pool to appear within by creating a pathway square like this i'm actually i'm gonna make it double width just so we don't throw out the the terrain uh, so double width double width double width come on come on come on <laughs> there we go so I've, I've created this this effect here and then i can lower the terrain using a slightly higher intensity and slightly higher brush so I get it to the level that I want it flatten out the terrain like this that will then enable you to put the water level right up to the to the top and then you could just build your pool around it so in this in this instance you now wouldn't need necessarily this this second line so you just have your first line here take out all of this like that and then move this to here whoops taking out too many 
uh, and then move this up one. Take out that. And then copy this on a small grid as well. Uh, I'm just going to take out those two. Like that. And then I'm going into because this is the this is the wrong way around, so it's on the or on the wrong side of the grid. But there you go. Um, and so that's that's the principle that, that you're using here. Um, and then if you sink that into the ground some more, so that it's level with your with your pathway, you can then carry on using that same plaza technique from the first episode, um, just to create that element that illusion that this is coming right up to the edge and then you fence it off and wall it off however however you see fit so if you're wanting to raise it above the, the ground level and having having it as a pond you're going to struggle because of the way that the the terrain works but it's one way of one way of doing it um and then you sort of fake the the idea you you're not really going to be able to get a thin wall with water because we don't have the water dynamics in planet coaster to be able to do it like we do in planet zoo um because we don't have water containment physics but it's easier to sink them into the ground than they than it is to sink them above um and yeah so you just then decorate along here you wall it off put your appropriate signage and then you have a, a, a pool area the other thing i like to do as well is give the because it's likely to be an artificial pool right it's not going to be a it's going to be like a fountain it's not going to be a, a lake um and so the other thing i like to do is to actually give it a bottom as well um, so just gives you that now impression that it's a it's a lake that's been that's got a concrete concrete base to it it's got concrete walls and it's a plaza area and again you're just creating that illusion of the plaza your path doesn't meet the end of the pool but it still creates that illusion that it does um the other the other thing that you can do actually is is as part of the uh, episode three use a splash pad and just use the art shapes to create the illusion of water so you just create the blue uh, art shape and then put your fountains in and it creates a splash pad that's a far easier way of doing it but if you're wanting to use real water then you can do it that way yeah sorry for the awkward edit that's just been in there i got to actually editing the final thing and realized that there's a question i didn't actually answer and that's all around the water table of, of log flumes and the water table of parks so i've just had to record a real short segment that i'm going to pop in at, at some point so yeah sorry for the awkward edit but when you're dealing with log flumes and when you're dealing with the water table, you have to understand where water flows and you have to understand the principles of water. So water will always find the lowest level. Everyone knows that, right? So water will always flow and find the lowest level. But when you're dealing with um, things like hills and you're dealing with like terrain, this can create little pockets of water and pockets of areas. And so you have to sort of identify whether your water is going to collect in a natural place and flow to a natural resting area or whether you want it to be artificially held somewhere uh, for use later on. So this is what we're achieving in this log flume here. The lowest point of this ride is this pool at the bottom here. So when this ride is not in operation, all of the water that's in the troughs and all of the water that's everywhere else is going to end up in this lower lake. So you would probably make sure that the lake itself and the water level of the lake is slightly lower than it really needs to be because you have to account for the water that's in the trough. So the water level would be lower when the ride's in operation than it would be when it's higher. And if you ever want to see this in real life, go and see a rapids ride that's not working. You'll see that the channels are completely empty and there'll be a, a, a pond or some kind of lake where the water collects. And then you also need to understand that where, where your water is going to spill out and spill over the edge because it's either the buoyancy of the boats is causing it to be that way or the way that the, the channel is. And so... On this log flume, we've got this area here where you're going to have boats that are potentially going to be stacking up along the uh, along here by the station, especially if there's any kind of emergency or any kind of evacuation or any kind of delay in the station. Uh, so the boats are going to be backing up. The water is still going to be flowing because this is almost essentially flowing downhill into the into the station. So you'd have to understand that you're going to have overspill from this channel, and that overspill is going to collect. Well, if you if you don't allow it the facility to collect efficiently and effectively you're going to lose that water it's going to sink into the ground and so in this instance you'd create almost like an artificial lake for this water to sit and then 
you you then decide when you're doing it whether you're going to have a natural flow between this lake which is slightly higher and this lake which is lower and you do that via waterfalls and it would be almost like a river and it would just flow freely whenever it needs to or whether you're going to artificially move the water and in this case we've decided that this is going to be an artificial albeit natural looking but an artificial lake that's then fed by pipes so there's a set of pipes here and there's a set of pipes here and the water can be transferred from one to the other using either pumps or free flowing um, so they are different levels but they are artificially controlled and then you've also got the element here of it being artificially stored and so you use this when you're wanting to actually physically use the water where you might want to have a bank of water to call on if there's not enough water coming down the channel so if for any reason the water stops along here you've still got this pool of water here uh, that can be drag dragged in through the treatment pumps and whatever and then taken up the lift hill and then taken around the side here and again this is fed by artificial pipes so the water would be pumped from this bottom lake up to this treatment area and then back this way through the through the lake as well so when, when you're dealing with the realism in terms of the lay of the land you'd need to identify where your water is going to collect where are your lowest point of the rides and where are your uh, backups going to be when it comes to boats and everything because remember that the principle of putting something in water is it's going to overflow so you want somewhere to catch it and if you don't have somewhere that it can efficiently be caught then you're going to lose water to the natural water table of the uh, of the area around so you need to find a way of, of capturing it so anyway i just wanted to answer that question uh, just as we were uh, editing the, the episode so i really hope you found this episode helpful i hope it's answered the questions that, that you've had and i hope that the detail i've given you hasn't bored you too much because i know this is quite a long episode and we've gone into a lot of detail with a few demonstrations and everything along the way so i really genuinely do hope that this has helped if i've not answered anything or you've got any additional questions then you know what to do leave them in the comments below and i'll come back and i'll answer them um and just like all of the other episodes thank you so much for all of your interactions your likes your comments your subscriptions and everything all of that feeds the youtube algorithm and it and everything that you do everything that you do feeds into that algorithm for youtube to then go out and suggest it to other people to verify all of those actions so the more you interact the more it gets seen by other people and the more the channel grows so thank you thank you for that but until we speak again until episode six i hope you all stay safe thank you all so much for joining me today and i'll speak to you soon take care now bye bye